This is Audio Buddha. Audio Buddha presents Map of the Journey The Progress of Insight Based on Mahasi Sayadaw's book, Manual of Insight Talked by Steve Armstrong Part 2 Introduction to Mahasi Sayadaw's Manual of Insight So the topic this weekend is going to be um, the practice of Vipassana and the process you go through uh, from beginning to end, you might say, from first um, hearing the teachings of mindfulness and the development of insight uh, in the context of the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, and then the different uh, practices and experiences that can be and will be at least touched upon, if not experienced by most people, uh, when you practice um, uh, insight or vipassana meditation, up to and including uh, accessing the unconditioned nibbana for the first stage of enlightenment. So, <clears throat> put your seatbelt on, and um, we'll see how far we get this weekend. I'm taking much of my teaching uh, this weekend from uh, the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition out of Burma. And uh, Mahasi Sayadaw was a scholar during the last century, a really renowned uh, scholar in Burma. And he was also a practitioner, someone who practiced uh, meditation and found a way to uh, teach the meditation to lay people like ourselves, not just to monks and nuns, but to lay people in the form of an intensive retreat, not just as a devotional lifestyle but to actually teach them in an intensive retreat so that they could um, get results, so to speak, or they could really see the effects of their efforts, their mindfulness efforts, even within the matter of a few days. And then if they practice that way for a month or two, which was suggested, then over the course of a few years, they could really make some progress, meaning progress in understanding the teachings of the Buddha and the uh, teachings of the uh, Four Noble Truths and the uh, discovery of uh, the relief from Dukkha, or the First Noble Truth. So, the, um, just, just to say that these teachings uh, have only recently become available uh, to us in the West uh, and uh, in Vipassana, or Mindfulness Meditation, uh, was uh, was an unknown word uh, 40 years ago. I mean, as, as popular as mindfulness is now, having even arrived on the cover of Time magazine, uh, you know, 45 years ago, the, te- the students from America and uh, England were just returning from their years of practice in Asia and starting to teach mindfulness. But uh, you, you, you could think that as popular as mindfulness is now and as universally applicable as it is for stress management and uh, relapse, relapse prevention for depression and mindful schools, kids in schools, and just so many different applications, you'd think that it had been around as a, a panacea for all social, political, moral, and economic ills uh, since the beginning of time. But that's not so. So, uh, just, I want to give just a little history, uh, just to kind of contextualize what it is that we're doing here. And it all starts back when England ruled the world, and Briti- uh, Burma was a British colony. And because uh, when England occupied Burma, or other countries, they did some damage to the local indigenous uh, religions uh, of those people. But by the time they got to Burma, uh, the queen had given some instruction that they weren't to interfere with uh, the teachings, the the religious practices or spiritual practices of the people in Burma. But that had a kind of counterintuitive effect in that the king of Burma was the main patron of the Burmese monks. And when they came when the British came, the first thing they did was ship the king off to exile in India. And so the monastic order of Burma was threatened because they had no more patron. 
So, in fact, what they intended not to do is exactly what they did. They threatened the, uh, the Buddhist uh, teachings and practices in Burma. So that prompted the elder monks at that time to get really uh, concerned about how they were going to preserve the teachings of the Buddha for their people. And they started uh, a very active uh, education program where they started teaching lay people the teachings of the Buddha, where mostly they used to be in the monastery for the monks and nuns. Uh, they started teaching the lay people, and they really took to it, and they, they got very educated over the course of a couple of decades. The people of Burma got very educated, <clears throat> and they even wanted to learn how to meditate, which was kind of unheard of, I think, before then. Very few lay people meditated. But they did start doing some meditation, and then in 1940. Uh, nine, Mahasi Sayadaw was invited to open a meditation center in Rangoon for lay people, householders like ourselves. And the understanding was that uh, they didn't need all that learning that the monks learned. They could just get some very pragmatic instructions. And if they were guided uh, carefully, that even in the course of a, a week or a month or two months, uh, they could really see the teachings of the Buddha and they realized the, the benefit of the teachings of the Buddha in their own mind, in their own heart. So the meditation center that he opened in Rangoon became wildly popular. I mean like Justin Bieber-ish, <laughs> I guess, to use a Canadian. Uh, and, and it was just like, you know, hundreds, thousands of people came to the meditation center to practice meditation. And uh, foreigners also were allowed to come. And one of those foreigners was this fellow from India, uh, Anagarika Manindra, who went and studied at the Mahasi Center for uh, eight years, studied and practiced. Then he returned to uh, Bogaya, where he was the, um, the kind of the caretaker of the Burmese Vihara in Bogaya. And that's where Westerners found this teaching. That's where Joseph and Ramdas and Sharon, uh, Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, and others uh, started practicing with Manindra there. And they were the senior teachers of bringing insight and Vipassana to America and the West in England and Canada also. So that's, a, that's the brief history. And it's, it's important to know that uh, in a lot of Buddhist countries, the practices for lay people was to be devotional and to support the monks and nuns with generosity. That was their practices. Uh, in Burma, they also were very supportive of the monks and nuns, but um, their understanding also included study and meditation for lay people. But they understood that the practices for lay people uh, to do in an ongoing way were the paramis. The, the, par the ten paramis, the ten forces of goodness, generosity, truthfulness, loving kindness, equanimity, resolve, effort, patience. I always forget a couple, but you know what I mean. They are those qualities of mind that are good qualities of beings everywhere. And uh, these, when undertaken in our daily life, in our domestic, civic, social, professional uh, responsibilities and obligations, roles and commitments, then these paramis, to the extent that they are developed in our own heart, they are the foundation upon which insight unfolds. So if they're not developed, you can do all the intensive retreats you want and you're not going to get too far with developing Vipassana insight. But to the extent that you actively develop the paramis, then your, your, the progress of your insight or the unfolding of your knowledge will be deeper, more profound, more comprehensive, if you say. So uh, we should understand that uh, the teachings that I'll be offering from Mahasi Sayadaw's Manual of Insight, which is just recently published in English, um, the teachings that I'm going to be offering from that is, is predicated upon those who wish to practice 
mindfulness in, to develop insight, uh, also understand that their main task is to develop the paramis. And depending on that, then this the guidance in this book will proceed as outlined in the book. Okay? So we should understand that all of our practice of patience and kindness and loving kindness and generosity, this is the foundation for the development of the insights as outlined in this book. I just want to read a comment that uh, Joseph Goldstein, uh, one of the senior teachers um, uh, in America who first brought this tradition of practice to the West, said in writing a foreword to this book, he said, The widespread introduction of mindfulness, now taking place in America and other Western countries, has its roots largely in the teachings of Mahasi Sayadaw and his great ability to convey the practical means of awakening. Although mindfulness in its secular applications has tremendous benefits, it's helpful to remember that the original teachings of the Buddha are about liberation, that is, freeing the mind from those mental states that cause suffering to oneself and others. So that's the direction we're going um, this weekend, is looking at the practice of mindfulness for the development of insight to liberate the mind from not just suffering, but the causes of suffering. And I'll point out that distinction later in the weekend. So that's a little bit about Mahasi Sayadaw. When Mahasi Sayadaw passed away, Sayadaw Upandita, who many of you have heard about, uh, became the abbot or the chief uh, preceptor, monk, at the uh, monastery, at the Mahasi Meditation Center. And he is the uh, Burmese monk that's most responsible for getting the teachings of Mahasi Sayadaw into the West, because he came to the, to the West a lot and taught all of the senior teachers in the, in the West, and uh, many of whom ordained with him for a period of time. And I myself also went to Burma and uh, ordained with uh, Sayadaw Upandita, stayed at the Mahasi Meditation Center for five years and learned this, learned this practice. So it was uh, in the year 2000, which was 10 years after I had disrobed and I'd been teaching for 10 years, um, that I returned to Burma. And in speaking with a former monk that I knew there, I asked him what he was doing and he said he was going to translate Mahasi Sayadaw's uh, book called The Way of Vipassana. And I said, or I said, uh, you mean Mahasi Sayadaw had the book called The Way of Vipassana that hasn't been translated into English? And he said, yeah, it hasn't been translated into English. Just one chapter, chapter five had. And I said, well, that seems like a kind of a big gap in our, those of us who are interested in practicing mindfulness and insight. And I should think that'd be a pretty important book for for Westerners or English readers to have. And he said, yeah, it would be. It would be really important. So I said, okay, I would like to uh, subsidize you to translate that book. So I set him up on a monthly stipend for a couple of years, and uh, he worked on translating the book when he could, which is only a couple hours a day when he had electricity. That's the way it was in Burma at those days. So but nevertheless, we got the book, and over the course of the next... 14 years, <laughs> we uh, edited it and did the research to uh, fill it out. And um, I now have to say that uh, it's a pretty good looking book and it's got a lot of good stuff in it. And it was just released uh, a month or so ago by Wisdom Publications in the States. So this is where I'm going to be getting much of my information also today. This and my own experience over the last 40 years. So... I think one further clarification to add about the uh, Mahasi Sayadaw's teaching of the practice of insight and what's called the progress of insight is that these teachings weren't invented or weren't original to Mahasi Sayadaw. This was an oral tradition from the time of the Buddha. And it was first written down in a book called the Patsit Sambhita Maga, 
uh, four or five hundred years after the Buddha passed away. And it was further elaborated on in the Visuddhimagga, 500 years after the Buddha passed away. And then there's been a few commentaries on it since then. And Mahasi Sayada used those commentaries as the foundation for his uh, development of his practice and understanding the way of practice. So it's not, uh, it's not something invented just you know, a few decades ago in Burma. It's something from the time of the Buddha that has been elaborated more fully for our benefit or for modern times by Mahasi Sayada, who observed um, hundreds of thousands of people going through his monastery and practicing in this way. So it's pretty well documented, pretty well uh, confirmed by hundreds, thousands of uh, people who practice there, including hundreds of Westerners who can attest to the, to the um, efficacy of this method and these teachings and the value of uh, progressing uh, along this uh, process of insight. Uh, but I have to say, as I expounded on it to some extent last night, it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. And it takes a real... Uh, uh, dedication of energy and devotion to the teachings uh, and to your own aspiration for liberation if you wish to uh, reap the benefit, so to speak. But on the other hand, as difficult as it is, it's not impossible. So I'd like to read Mahasi Sayadaw's admonition. Is it an admonition? I'll let you decide. The explanations of how to practice insight that I have given here in this book are perfectly sufficient for those of fair intelligence. If they read this book and properly and systematically practice with strong faith, aspiration, and energy, they can surely attain the different insight knowledges as well as path knowledge and fruition knowledge, which is their way or his way of saying enlightenment or accessing the nibbana or becoming a stream mentorer. Those are different terms for uh, the first stage of enlightenment, path and fruition knowledge. However, it is impossible to mention here all of the different experiences that meditators may have, and there are many that I have not included. A meditator will not experience everything that is mentioned here either. A meditator will not experience... Oh, uh, the experience particular to one may be quite different from another's, depending on the maturity of his or her parami and the accuracy, precision, and continuity of his or her awareness. Moreover, it is impossible for a meditator's faith, aspiration, and energy to remain strong all the time. If a person practices by following teachings based on intellectual knowledge only, and without a teacher, he or she may have doubts and feel in uncertain, just like a person traveling alone in an unfamiliar place. So it is not easy for an ordinary person to attain the insight knowledges as well as path and fruition knowledges if he or she practices without a teacher who can give careful guidance. So I would like to advise you to practice under the close guidance of an experienced teacher who can clearly explain the stages of insight knowledge up through path and fruition, reviewing knowledge and the fruition absorption that comes after first stage. Please be humble. Do not think proudly. I'm special and don't need anyone's guidance. When you practice, do so sincerely. And that means with great effort and firm practice, you can attain Nibbana. That's why I even bother to teach this. Because it's possible. <laughs>